So uh, this month we have a, a panel discussion on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Um, and I will turn it over once I stop screen sharing to the moderators um, and they can introduce themselves and I'll turn off everyone else's video. Everyone else turn off your video if you're not a moderator or a panelist, please. So I don't have to do it. And we'll go from there. So um, let's see, uh, Valerie, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, interwebs. Uh, I'm Valerie Regis. I'm a DevOps engineer at Airbus, and uh, I am passionate about diversity and inclusion in the workplace for all sorts of reasons, mostly because it makes good business sense, and I'm a capitalist at heart. Um, so I'm so excited to be here tonight, and uh, I'm actually taking a break from the beach to be here. Speaking of working remotely from Maine and such, I'm in Florida. I put down my fruity beverage, and I'm here to discuss this important topic, and I'm very excited. Uh, we've got some great panelists. Uh, let's start with Erica Stanley. Madam, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Stanley. I'm Senior Engineering Manager at Mozilla. I work on the mixed reality team on uh, Firefox Reality. Um, and I also do quite a bit of community work. I started Atlanta's uh, network of women who code uh, back in 2013. And I also work with, uh, with the directors of women who code, Angel and Beth, um, also work on a conference called Refactor. Um, both are very focused on uh, inclusion and diversity and, and how we can make tech a more inclusive place. Awesome. If, if, if you've not been to Refactor, by the way, it's one of my favorite conferences and I go to a lot of them. It's a really, really good one. Um, we've also got with us Anthony Tessman. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, well, Anthony Tessman here. Um, I'm from the IBM Corporation. Um, I'm in corporate HR, so I have a specific focus on the recruitment of diverse talent, right, across the business. Um, I hire for all business units. So from a corporate HR perspective, as you can imagine, IBM is silos and businesses, um, systems, software, services, et cetera. So I feel demand from a diversity standpoint um, for those business units. I've been with IBM going on 23 years now. I served in a variety of roles. So I started IBM as a seller, right? Um, uh, inner city kid myself from the Bronx, New York, um, and really kind of made my name in the sales arena and moved over to corporate HR. So excited to, you know, share some perspectives with you all tonight and hope I can deliver some value. Oh, that's awesome. Really excited to get your perspective on some things. Um, our last panelist is going to be Brian Trejo. We want to introduce yourself, sir. Sure thing. Hey everybody, Brian Trejo, by day, product manager at the Home Depot, focused on everything payments, pretty much, so everything .com payments. Um, and by night, I, you know, similar to Erica, actually started the chapter of Tequeria, which is the largest community of Latinx technologists in the U.S. Um, so started the Atlanta chapter here, co-leading that with uh, another wonderful product manager, Margarita Caraballo, who works at MailChimp. Um, yeah, excited to be here. That is awesome. Um, so I always like to, if, if we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, these are these are words that get thrown out a lot in meetings, words that people like to use to sound progressive, but they don't always know what they actually mean. Um, would one of our panelists like to just start out by explaining what demarks diversity and inclusion, the difference and how those actually are practiced. Well, I was gonna let my peers go first, right? Uh, I always hate to be the first one to take a stab at it. So, you know, from, from my perspective, from my, my standpoint, uh, diversity for me, when I'm out on the field and I'm searching for talent is uniqueness, right? And uniqueness can come in a variety of angles, um, race, religion, 
political beliefs, you know, across the board. So it's really, to me, the core is the uniqueness of a human being um, and how that uniqueness delivers value to the roles that I'm seeking. And so that's diversity in a nutshell to me, uh, which is different than inclusion, right? In inclusion um, simply infers just that. Um, we have people in the world with what we call diverse abilities, right? It used to be uh, people with disabilities. So diverse abilities, just because that human being um, has a diverse ability doesn't mean they cannot deliver value at an accelerated pace, right? So, you know, they're kind of two different pockets there from a diversity inclusion perspective. That's the Anthony Tessman view. It's a great view. Yeah, I um, I'm always uh, amused when people talk about DNI, and they, they, I think people conflate uh, diversity and inclusion. You know, diversity being representation from all sorts of different groups of people, and inclusion being a welcoming, supportive, useful work environment where people are treated with respect. And it's, it, I think the inclusion part's always a lot harder <laughs> than the diversity part. Can I can I add something on to that too, Valerie? Um, so I like to think of it like diversity is a metric. Diversity is something uh, that honestly is a lagging indicator for inclusion in a lot of ways. So your, your comment about how inclusion is harder, I, I think it's harder because that's where you start the work um, and you don't see the, the benefit of that work until you start to see more diversity on your teams. If you go the other way and you start working towards diversity before you have determined, you know, whether this is an inclusive team, you're really just going to see a lot of turnover. If, if you're going to bring the, the first woman, um, the first person of color, the first person with disabilities onto your team, and you haven't done a little bit of introspection to determine, you know, what are the ways that we need to make this team more inclusive? that person is just going to end up facing all of, you, you've brought that person to a toxic environment is, is what you've done. Um, and that person is going to face all of the, the issues we see with diversity and inclusion before you can fix them. Um, because diversity is that lagging indicator. Oh yeah. So I, I would like to, to kind of address why diversity is an admirable goal. And um, I'm always quick to, to point out to people it's not about feeling good or being a good person even from a business perspective. Um, I think it's uh, Kim Creighton always says that uh, diversity and inclusion are risk management issues. <laughs> like the, um, just if you would like to have a successful business, you have to have a diverse team with lots of perspectives. Can, can you all sort of address why that is, why it matters? I think you hit it right on the nose with that. I mean, it brings a diverse set of perspectives when you have a diverse team. Um, I mean, take, for example, what happened with Snapchat not too long ago with um, the filters, things like that. They're, they're getting in a lot of trouble on and off again, um, simply because, I mean, I figure that the people that are on the other side of the table there aren't diverse. Um, and these are things that somebody that, you know, comes from that background would instantly recognize as an issue. Um, but from the business perspective, uh, there are opportunities that uh, some folks that you know, are, are taking up these spaces, maybe wouldn't consider. Um, take, for example, I work in payments, the underbank, unbank population, that's something that you would see commonly amongst uh, black, and, black and brown folk. And it's a conversation that you haven't really heard of, at least internally within Home Depot. Um, so it's something that, you know, is a perspective that I would bring from the table as somebody that uh, grew up in a household that was largely uh, underbanked. And so uh, I think from a business perspective, it can open up and uncover some new opportunities for the business. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think Brian hit it right on. You know, when you deliver an innovative solution, so from an IBM standpoint, you know, we deliver innovation to our clients and you need diverse teams to deliver that differentiated value, right? And so from a teaming aspect, if you don't have a diverse team, your success is not as strong as it could be. Um, and, and you know, throughout the organization, many organizations have pockets where there are lack of diversity, right? Um, and sometimes that will show in their business results, right? You know, so from a recruitment standpoint, um, 
I'm a, I'm a black male, right? And so I go to the HBCU, which is historically black colleges and universities to recruit. Um, you can't really, it won't be as effective to send a, a white colleague of mine to get the same result. It's not a racial thing. It's more of a culture embracing kind of thing. And I think as we start looking at diversity, we have to also look at the cultural requirements. Um, even Native Americans, right? A lot of Native Americans go to school, get a degree, but they return to their reservation to bring that skill set. Whereby, you know, you as a recruiter is like, hey, you know, you get ready to graduate, we got a job. No, that's not how their culture works. So I think diversity of mind, diversity of skill set, and diversity of execution delivers innovation, you know, in our work, in our world from a global aspect. And when you lack that, your business results show that in subtle ways. Again, just again, an Anthony Tessman opinion, right? My remarks don't represent IBM. <laughs> you know, just put my disclaimer out there, right? And, and I would add also um, kind of getting into some of those business results, you're leaving money on the table oftentimes if you're not thinking through diversity inclusion, building products for all people. Um, and if you don't have a diverse team that can ask those hard questions that you need to when you're um, at the beginning um, of building a product, um, a lot of times they never make it into the product. And now you've created a product that only solves solutions for a, a subset of people. And so there's so many people of, of different backgrounds that you've now um, left money on the table. You've created something that a, a large group of people can't use. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm always amused by um, sort of products gone wrong because of, you know, a homogenous development team. I mean, so I, one of my favorites was uh, a manufacturer of pool floaties. They produced this float for, um, for going to the pool and it was white with a blue strip down the center and they thought it was so beautiful. It looked like a maxi pad and they didn't have a single woman on the team who designed this to let them know wow, guys, that looks like a menstrual product. And so they released this product and it was, you know, obviously a flop, um, you know, a fun flop. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's good business to get different perspectives and have that person at the table who can say, uh, I'm a Newton Vita, uh, maybe we should rethink this. <laughs> and one of our, um, one of our, our uh, audience members uh, threw out the um, example of the facial recognition fiascos that have gone on. Um, also the automatic soap dispensers that can only sense white skin. I mean, these, these are things that are not conducive to making all the money, which I, I feel like is a very American ideal. <laughs> so how do we, how do we get to, you know, obviously you, you want to start with inclusion and make sure that your workplace is a supportive place for all candidates to come and be successful. How do we start moving towards making sure that our teams, our, our offices, that we are supporting people of all different abilities, cultures, and backgrounds? Oh, I can jump to that one because that's kind of in my bailiwick, right? You know, first and foremost, um, for me, from a recruitment standpoint, and I heard Vince mention earlier, he's been in the recruiting arena for years, the recruiting dynamic has changed, right? It used to be big companies come around and, and, and everybody goes running and peddling. Now candidates want you to market to them. They want you to know them, right? So from a diversity standpoint, ensuring that there's an equal playing field, um, a lot of business units or hiring managers have specific universities that they like, might be their alma mater. We have to break those trends, right? That's number one. Um, just because, you know, this student goes here and that's the alma mater, had you looked at the lack of diversity on your team and the skill sets of this diverse candidate, let's measure them together. So I hold my business units accountable um, because I make a sincere impact for the IBM cross business across the business, right? Um, so it's really understanding the business requirements and you have to find the talent to fill those requirements. So we can't just say, I want a black person, we don't have any black people, or we don't have any Latino people. Okay, perhaps that skill set is a rarity. Like for example, 
cognitive developers, right? You know, you guys know about the different cognitive developers are kind of hard to find in the diversity space, right? And then there's also, you know, I got to kind of throw this out there, you know, the systems of systemic racism, right? As you look at the assessment tools of today, you know, they're all over the place. As a as an HBCU student, you're in a computer science program. The school is primarily engineering, but they've carved out a computer science, but they haven't really prepared you with the tools of assessment. You're ready to go code and you know, however, but you have hacker rank, you have coder bite, you have all these assessment tools that tend to be barriers for our students of color. So that's why I came up with the HBCU Blue Movement Program. Um, I built this up with nothing but um, volunteers within the business, people of color. I have about 47 people, um, instructors, coordinators, and mentors that actually deliver the program. It's a boot camp. Um, and I identify diverse students leveraging the different sourcing tools that we have today, Handshake, et cetera. I identify the students and, you know, they have to take a pre-assessment, right? You, you need to have the foundational skills to get in my program is 10 weeks, right? You earn a badge. So I take these candidates, right? Don't apply to anything at IBM. You know, wait till I finish you up. And then I present these candidates to the business. So there's no question about their skill sets and their ability because I've trained them. I use all the tools that we assess them on. No question. So I think that it's a rebuilding of our systems to ensure that there's a pathway and funnel for diverse candidates. Just, you know, on, on all spectrum, right? You know, we have to ensure that our candidates from a diversity standpoint are armed properly to compete and fill those roles. And then our machine continues to run. Absolutely, I love that. Um, I always like to, to, to think about, you know, you want to hire the best person for the job. And, you know, you talked about going to certain alma maters and, and recruiting in certain places. If you're only recruiting in places that typically uh, are, are occupied by a certain kind of person, and that's where you're recruiting, you're not getting the best person for the job. You're getting the best person from that subset for the job. I mean, I, I think of um, diversity hiring not as checking a box or trying to, you know, collect the set of humans <laughs> it's finding the best people the the brightest the the most creative but you have to get out there and make sure that you're recruiting from all the different places to make sure that who you're getting is the best for the role how can we support those efforts as as team members you know i'm for example if there's a job opening where i work i'm likely to put that up on women who code or send it to a friend i have at dev slash color and and try to you know move that information to different groups how else can we be supportive of getting the best candidates and making sure that we're reaching diverse populations of people i mean i think that's a really great way of doing it is there's all these really awesome organizations here in Atlanta and beyond Atlanta um, that primarily focus on that particular uh, diverse set of candidates. So like say Tequeria, Latinx technologists, on average four years of work experience across the board, um, you know, six plus years if you were to look at the, the higher end here. Um, so they're out there. It's just a matter of being able to have relationships with these organizations and be able to uh, post these jobs within their boards, support what they're doing to be able to continue uh, building up and expanding as well. Um, I, I, and I know kind of um, to, to touch on that a little bit more, not only thinking about, you know, as a community organizer, not only thinking about my own organization, but as you said, Valerie, um, plugging other organizations that are doing equal work um, elsewhere for different communities like women who code, um, like Dev Color, like Technologists of Color, you know, there's many organizations here in Atlanta that do a lot of really good, like out in tech, um, and, and being able to make sure that they have also that opportunity to plug to their folks of like, hey, these are these really great opportunities at this company, I vouch for them, um, post. 
And then something that you mentioned, Brian, was uh, kind of building those relationships. And I think it ties back into something that Anthony was saying, where he was talking about, he actually goes out to a lot of the, the HBCUs um, where he's recruiting. I've gone to you know different meetups or user groups or, or different places where I knew this was a group outside of, um, say, the typical uh, places we might recruit. Um, I've gone to schools um, that, that we typically would not recruit um, at just to make sure that we are gathering from a, a large pool. Um, and I think that's really important is to make sure that your pool is as diverse as you can make it. Absolutely. Okay, so we're, we're recruiting from diverse locations. We're, we're trying to get the best candidates in. Um, can we talk about what it's like to be the first of an underrepresented group in the workplace? I mean, the look on some of my coworkers' faces the first time I talked about ex-girlfriends, because I do have a husband, so they were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have a disability. I, I have complex uh, PTSD, and it makes me quirky. Um, you know, being the first person in an office to discuss differences or to look different, you know, what have your experiences been like over the years, either on your own behalf or, or with coworkers, trying to navigate being different? Man, that is so good you said that. I was waiting for that. So, um, I'm sorry, guys, I got to jump into this one because I got one for you. So, as I shared with you, you know, I've been with IBM for 23 years. Um, I started out here in Atlanta. I've been my whole career in the state of Georgia. I started out as the only black male, black person on the state of Georgia sales team, right? Like 19, okay? When I started, when I was first put on board, they gave me the worst account. If you guys are from Georgia, you know there's a town called Osceola. You go down 75, way down about three hours, you get off 75 and you go about 10 miles of cotton fields and old slave shacks. I mean, it is really, there's a company called Tanner Medical down there, you know. So they gave me that account. And my first trip out there, you know, I, and I'm from New York, so I'm not from the South. I really don't, I didn't come here with that, you know, mindset. Um, and I'm also a veteran, right? So I do have a concealed firearms license, so I travel without fear. Um, so, you know, I go down here, um, and it was so rural, and it was no black. I felt like I was set up, so I went there. You know, the customer was was tolerant, right? So, you know, I I, I was driving back after an hour and a half of discussion with nothing but older Southern white men, um, knowing they didn't receive me, I'm not going to sell anything, just crush three hour ride down there, mind you, from Atlanta. So on my way back, I thought about it. I said, I'm a strong, intelligent black man. Plus, I want to make all the money on the team. I don't want no one on the team making more money. Um, and I got, I'm going to loop, loop you in too, Brian, at Home Depot. So I thought about it. I recruited peers, um, young ladies, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, very appeasing to the eyes. Brought them on my next sales call. Closed the deal. First deal in South Georgia, 2.7 million. So, you know, I'm riding back. I'm feeling really good. I got a lead for Home Depot, which you guys office right there on Pacey's Ferry. I don't know if you know about their IT infrastructure, but they used to buy Power Series, RS6000s, Unix servers. I, I closed that whole deal, and you guys sold those worldwide, globally. It was your back-end POS system. I raked in big dough my third year at IBM. So I had to go through that to earn respect, dignity. There was nobody I could lean to or now obviously that's changed over the years but this is a large company where there's no overt open racism but the the accounts I was assigned and the quota that I was to attain was just ridiculous right um so that was me yes I experienced it at IBM in my first years um 
but I went into it with a different mindset. Instead of feeling victimized, isolated, disrespected, and marginalized, I propelled myself that I'm better than all of you all. Watch my pockets grow, right? And so that was 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 my winning piece to overcome it. You know, sort of was your question, Valerie. You know, how did you overcome it? Um, I won, right? I won. Um, so, so that's you know just the Anthony Testament personal story there with IBM. What about you, Erica? So uh, I'd say for the first 10 years of my career, I was always the only, (laughs) Um, whether it was the only black person, the only woman, the only black woman. Um, And so, but the experience was different on different teams. There were teams where, of course, I was the only person um, that looked like me, but I didn't feel that way. And then there were teams where I was constantly reminded (laughs) that I'm the only person that looks like me. And on those teams, I would say there was this kind of constant proving yourself. Um, And to Anthony's point, I just made sure that every time that came up, I just stunk them. I just made sure that they regretted questioning my skill set in that case. Um, I had a a situation where I was fresh out of grad school. I was, I did uh, a few years towards a PhD at uh, UNC. Um, and then uh, ended up going into web development because at the time, uh, everyone wanted, I had done a lot of 3D interactive graphics uh, for my specialization. And at the time, everybody wanted people with like 10 years of experience and I was 24. So (laughs) I did not have 10 years of 3D development experience. So I went into uh, web development and I was at a company and we had to like build a, a pie chart or something and it required math and it required trig. Um, again, I just came from a program, a PhD program doing 3D math and algebra and physics. And uh, there were all of these questions of, we don't know if she can do it. Um, we, don't, we don't know if she can do the math, the trigonometry that I had in 10th grade necessary <laughs> to, to do this. And so there was supposed to be this huge project that, that we were supposed to take months to do. Um, and I was so mad when I went home. A friend of mine worked there with me and he was just kind of like, he had the, the whole eating the popcorn meme going because he was like, what is she going to do? I literally went home and finished it that night. I finished all, <laughs> all of my responsibility that night and they never questioned again whether I could do the math. So that was something I had to face early in my career. Um, it, it's less now. Um, and I've also kind of become, I've been in a position where Um, I don't have to do that anymore. And so I think that's important to say and to to address um, for the next person coming behind you so that they don't constantly have to uh, go through these these arbitrary tests of, of, you know, do they belong here when they they pass the interview just like everyone else and they do the work like everyone else. So as I grew in my career, I got to the point where I said, I don't have to do this and I'm not. Um, And I think that that makes a difference standing up for yourself in that way. I think that makes a difference, not just for you, uh, but for the people coming behind you. Brian, have you had similar experiences with this, this sort of feeling that um, like we've just heard two personal stories where you're coming in, you maybe look different or you're seen as different and you have to prove yourself to be not just sufficient, but the best to get by. Have you had similar experiences? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking that um, it's just like, ain't that some shit where you have to work two times, five times, 10 times as hard just to prove yourself as opposed to some of your peers who are coming into the same level and they're doing, you know, they're just getting by. Um, and you really have to go above and beyond to prove yourself. And, and for me, that's definitely something that I've, um, you know, similar to Erica, I've sort of pump the brakes on that over the years, just as I've gained more experience, you know, my resume just sort of speaks for itself now. Um, but early on in my career, I would do something similar, like be it data crunching, um, be it now, be it uh, pitches that I have to give for internal features that we want to develop. Um, I actually been on email threads where they thought that I wasn't on there and they were like, I don't think you can actually do this. Like, don't waste your time. And that just fired me up. Um, and, and I mean, naturally, I'm very competitive. I ran cross country and track in college. Um, so that competitive fire, it was just always something in the back of my head of, 
um, never being enough and, and wanting to go above and beyond and prove that I am. Um, and I mean, still to this day, and, you know, I kind of see it as a competitive advantage for, for a lack of better words, is that um, we're always going to be working harder um, and until we realize that we don't have to. But by then, you know, we're going to have uh, a long trail of successes behind us. And, and hopefully that same trail is the trail that others um, other black and brown folk can also travel on, um, knowing that we've pioneered that path for them and, you know, we've opened some doors for them as well. I love that you mentioned that. So, um, you know, I, I feel like in this life, anytime we go through something particularly difficult, uh, one of the goals should be to make it so that other people don't have to go through the same negative experiences. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, mentoring other people who are maybe different and the difference between mentoring and sponsoring and kind of get in and, and discuss that piece. Who wants to take that one? Sure. So I would say the difference between mentor, so mentoring is um, advising someone. Um, I would say sponsorship is advocating for that person. Um, anyone can be a mentor. Um, to you, um, but to be a sponsor, they need to be able to get in places that you might not naturally um, be able to um, access. Um, so to give an example, you might have someone who gives you advice on the, the programming language you want to learn to get into machine learning. Um, and then on the other side, you might have someone sponsor you and say, uh, well, you know, Valerie has been learning Python and she's been kicking butt and I think she's ready for this project. And so that's the difference between um, a mentorship relationship, which is important, but also sponsorship. And uh, I think a lot of cases people are given a lot of advice um, and told what's the right thing to do without getting the opportunities, without getting the foot in the door, um, without getting someone who can speak for them when they're not in the room. I agree with Erica. We call them power sponsors, right? You can have a ton of mentors um, throughout your career, but can they really, you know, help your trajectory or get you where you need to go? So the sponsor is more action oriented and your mentor is more developmental. So how can we be good sponsors? How can we, as teammates and as, as people in the industry, how can we go about um, knowing who needs to be uh, spoken for, who needs to be supported, who needs to be advanced, and how can we go about being those sponsors and lifting up other people? So something I've picked up from uh, my time at Women Who Code is, um, we all enjoy kind of pushing people and making them feel uncomfortable. <laughs> That's what Valerie's nodding. Um, and so uh, finding that thing that when you ask someone about it, they're like, mm, I don't know, but you can tell that they're interested. Um, finding opportunities for them to do that um, and making sure that when they get that opportunity and, and as you see them growing and, and uh, making a lot of progress, that they get opportunities for visibility as well. Uh, there's, uh, there's, actually getting the opportunity to do the work is something that might be high profile, but in, then it's getting the visibility that this person uh, succeeded, this person accomplished this. Um, and that's something that I think doesn't happen in uh, when you're dealing with people from marginalized backgrounds a lot. We don't always know how to um, uh, speak up for ourselves in that way or to speak up for our accomplishments. Um, and so I am happy to be that person um, to speak up for someone else. I have a friend who is a principal engineer at Microsoft. And if anyone's ever worked at Microsoft, you know how hard the principal title is to, to attain. Um, and it's quite an accomplishment. And when she, um, she introduces herself a lot of times, she just says, I work at Microsoft. And it's like, no, she is a principal engineer <laughs> at Microsoft. Um, and and I, I might talk about some of the projects she's worked on. So doing those kind of things when people don't feel comfortable doing it or they're not in a position to do it, I think is, is one way we can sponsor. So I'm, uh, I'm a little bit of a cynic and I, I'm a lot of bit of a cynic and I won't say that I, I believe all people are inherently selfish except they are. So 
uh, I would like to kind of touch on the fact that, you know, sometimes when we talk about, you know, being inclusive in the workplace and these initiatives, uh, I think sometimes there's a sense of altruism about it, but I'd like to touch on how doing the right thing from an ethical and moral perspective actually can help you further your own career. Things like if you are sponsoring someone and supporting them and also mentoring them, it makes you look good to be that person who's helping, that person who's fostering new talent. What are some other like benefits to the individual who's doing the right thing? And you know, how, how can people basically, I, it sounds awful, but use being a good person <laughs> to also further their career. So um, that's a good one, right? I, I, so because I'm in recruitment, I, that's what I do, right? I impact lives um, and change lives. So I get a lot of fulfillment in that alone. Um, and my rewards are really, you know, I'll see, well, before we could go to building, I, I've been working remote for the last 13 years. So this is nothing new to me. I'm the kind of guy that would like to go to an office sometime. Yeah, I need to make a hundred copies. You know, I'm going to come by, you're going to be around. Um, and I run into somebody that I've recruited, you know, years ago. I didn't forget them. You know, I kind of love and move. And it's sort of, oh, man, how are you doing? I've had students. Um, I had a student that had a, a diverse ability. And we were, I was sponsoring a hackathon, one of these IBM hackathons. And no one would choose him for a team. Anyway, I got him on his own team. He put his own project together. I think he was a C++ guy. Um, phenomenal. So I says, all right, I really like this kid. I'm going to have him come to our hackathon in RTP in Raleigh. And so I told him, sent him the email. His mother called me. His mother. You know, his mother was like, well, she didn't know. Well, she didn't know who I was. Did I know, you know, her son's? Um, status kind of thing. She was really wanting to protect her son. And so she called me and she was, you know, very abrasive. You know, my son told me X, Y, Z, I need to understand, you know, where's he going? Who's going to be taking him? And I let her go through it. Um, any event, to, to, to make a long story short, I got him to RTP, flew out of Hartsville. You know, I had somebody there, other students going. Um, I got that boy a job, right? I got him through the hackathon. I got him a job. His mother was so grateful. She wanted my address. She wanted to send me something. I was like, nah, time out. You know, I appreciate all that. But those are the things for me. So I don't really look for any tangible value other than, you know, that feeling, that warm feeling I get by helping the next person change their lives, right? You know, um, so that's me. So I sponsor a lot of the students that may not have that visibility, that we may not normally source, that we may not normally seek. I identify those students, I nurture them up, and I sponsor them into the business. You see what I'm saying? Um, so I do that on a regular. It's a little bit above and beyond my role, right? I'm supposed to identify and send but um, I take that extra step. So that's how I take it. You know, just it, it's a personal accomplishment for me. What about you, Brian? What are your What are your thoughts on this one? On um, mentorship versus sponsorship, and and how it personally impacts the person doing the work and helping. How how it helps the helper. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, as you mentioned earlier, like it's definitely helping the person um, that's actually giving the the accolades to whoever it is that's receiving them on the other end. Um, I think often, I mean, you know, we get folks that are leaders saying like, oh yeah, that person's good, um, but I want you to sign X person because they just have a track record of delivering whatever it may be. Um, but the, you know, say, for instance, this person, Maria, she's, you know, really good engineer, but then you got this other person, uh, Mike, who's always giving the top line projects and always, you know, getting the credit for everything that he's delivered, but Maria's really solid person um, and a really solid engineer. 
And so, you know, being able to pick those people out and saying like, no, I think I really want to work with Marie on this. Let's have Dylan or let's have whoever that person is, Mike, whoever that person is, focus on other things, um, gives that opportunity for them to actually step in into a role that maybe they didn't previously see themselves engaging in, whatever that work may, may be. And then also as that person taking them through as that sponsor, making sure that you're properly giving them the credit where credit is due of, you know, this person achieved X, um, presenting them to other people outside of their own organization. So for Home Depot, product and engineering sort of sit on separate sides of the table. Um, so the engineers operate within their own silos, products over here. And so whenever there is an opportunity like that, I make sure to pull out those engineers to say like, hey, product team, like here's my engineer that worked on this project. They did a really great job. Let them present it. Um, just so that there's a little bit more of that human factor as well. Um, Cause I think that's often forgotten whenever these sort of accolades are being given out between two different groups is that there are people that are building the solution and it's not just product going in, getting all the credit and then running with it, you know? Um, so I really think it's a, it's a two way street and being able to receive, receive uh, the accolades and then also giving it and making sure that you're pulling them all the way through. And, and I would also say um, there's some selfish um, organizational benefits and personal benefits. So if you're looking at the personal benefits of mentoring or sponsoring someone, a lot of times when you're looking for that person to promote to senior software engineer or lead engineer, you're looking to see if they're doing much mentoring, if they can bring a group of people with them. Um, and so that's one way that being a mentor, being a sponsor can actually help you in your career. Um, but then organizationally, and this goes back to a point that Brian was bringing up, um, uh, he mentioned there's that person that, that has a track record of always uh, doing this kind of work. Well, in my experience, that person is swamped. <laughs> that person gets all of the projects, all of the big projects, and yes, they will do a great job on them. But, you know, uh, from his example, Mike might have three of those going right now. And so we want to make sure that we are sharing the knowledge, that we don't silo knowledge on a team. Um, and so organizationally, it makes a lot of sense to share some of those larger product, uh, projects with someone who is capable, but who hasn't gotten an opportunity yet because that's new knowledge on the team. And now when you have uh, one of those big projects, you have two people you can go to and you don't have to go to Mike again. And Mike can get some sleep. And I feel like Mike always appreciates that. <laughs> so um, I'd like to, to kind of open it up to the people listening, the, um, to ask questions and, and you know, to take a minute to sort of fill in any gaps for, for those listening. Kind of say, I don't see all the beautiful videos that I saw when we first got on. I see all sorts of names. But does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Hey, Valerie. Hey, Chris. How y'all doing? Um, yeah, see a few familiar faces. Uh, I guess just a broad wave of the hand is, I was wondering if y'all could talk about burnout at all. So, um, that's something that we've been trying to address at Mozilla. It's, it's really tough right now. Um, so Mozilla is one of those places where at least 50% of the workforce has already been working remotely. Um, but working remotely and working at home in a pandemic are not the same thing. Um, and uh, people have their children at home. Um, people, there are single people who don't have family with them and who are now uh, working all day um to uh because they have the time and they there's nowhere else they're going and so how do you determine if that's burnout or if that's something that they are choosing to do to keep themselves busy um or if they're using that to kind of take advantage of the fact that that they now have this new time and so we've been checking in with people a lot more than we would typically do um so i think a lot of times in i'm a manager so i'm i'm having one-on-ones constantly and there are times where pulling like personal information from my team is a little hard because they're like, no, I want to tell you about this, this work I did, um, this was really cool um, uh, bug I fixed. 
And I absolutely want to hear about that, but I want to hear how you're doing. I want to hear how your family is, is coping. I want to hear um, if you uh, need to move work around, if we need to make allowances for you to take some time off. Um, and I would say one thing that I've seen happen is that people in upper management are leading the way. And so um, for my team, my manager's director of engineering, and he took some time off. He asked everyone to make sure they're taking time off and then he immediately took a week off. <laughs> so he, he was the change that he wanted to see on the team. Um, and so that is something that we can do, making sure that people are, are using that time that they have. That is an awesome point about being an example. I mean, how many times do we say these sort of, you know, make platitudes about self-care and how if you're not taking care of yourself, you, you won't be as productive, but then, you, you feel like you can't, you can't take the personal time. You can't step away from the machine. Um, that's an excellent point about as leaders being an example of self-care and preventing your own burnout so that the rest of your team feels entitled to do the same. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I, I, how is everyone surviving the pandemic? Uh, I personally am working remotely with three children. <sighs> Um, trying to, <laughs> trying to do anything deeply technical while homeschooling a fifth grader, a first grader, and then keeping the one-year-old from killing himself, because that's what one-year-olds do, um, has been a unique challenge. Like, how, how's everyone else faring with this, our new, new normal? Well, we have good work-life balance at IBM, so we have what we call uh, Summer Fridays. So, you know, if you're in corporate HR, nobody better not send you any type of invites for any calls after 12 noon. Um, obviously, you know, we have a very good work-life balance, so it never was stressful. But I miss traveling, right? I miss hitting campuses. I miss get hitting the road. So I have two children. I have a 16-year-old daughter. So you can imagine she hates me. You know, I can't go in a room anymore, that kind of stuff. Um, my son, you know, I'm, he's, he's video just out. He's just video game Roblox and Minecraft and, you know, so, um, we're balancing, you know, we haven't made the big jump to go anywhere though, right? I'm just, you know, outside of essential items that we pull up to Walmart and have them put it in the trunk. That's about it. Um, but I mean, I'm okay. I, I do get a little tired because we, we had we honored our internships at IBM this year, you know, regardless of the COVID. So this was the first time we ever stood up a 100% remote internship. So there's a lot of work involved in building that out and standing that up. And I had 76 interns here in the state of Georgia. Um, so, yeah, you know, you could get burnt out, Chris, but I don't allow it. And get burnt out you know I exercise my work life balance yeah I think there's a I'm not sure what's tougher being isolated by yourself during this or being at home with your family the whole time uh, so you, I, I think you know the the fact that people have an opportunity to congregate and visit but we can't miss each other if we never go anywhere um, so I've been gardening a lot. I got a lot of fish. That's uh, my tilapia aquaponic setup behind me. Got a bunch of outdoor tanks. I've been growing tomatoes. Um, just for a change of scenery, get away from the keyboard for a while, get out in the sun some. So you know, use what you got around you. You know, make sure, like you said, that work-life balance is important. Uh, it's it especially early in my career. I was. Uh, all about the grind and the hustle and trying to just code. And if I wasn't coding and working, if it wasn't billable, then I was reading or doing research of some sort. And you know, I, I can talk about gardening and DevOps and, and all that fun stuff and make it all fit. But sometimes a tomato is just a tomato. <laughs> wasn't it Freud who said that? Anyway. Um... So this is actually uh, one aspect of creating an inclusive work environment in these sort of unprecedented times. Um, you know, as, as was pointed out, we all have different family configurations, different unique challenges. 
to working remotely. And I've been very impressed uh, in my place of business. I'm the only person on my team that has a very young child. Most everyone else either has slightly older children who are more self-sufficient or they have a full-time stay-at-home partner, whereas you know, my, my partner is uh, an architect. So we're both, we're both hitting it all day. And <laughs> like, this just, there's no downtime. Um, <clears throat> and I've been very thankful and it's made me feel more um, stable in the workplace. The child-free single people who suddenly have more time and less responsibility and no commute have been sort of picking up slack for the parents and trying to redistribute work. And it's, I think it is one aspect of inclusivity. I mean, you know, I went through a pregnancy last year in the workplace and that was a crash course in how not inclusive the corporate world can be for parents. Um, so it's been really sort of making me feel a little bit better about humanity in general to, to see my coworkers step up and say, all right, parents, I'll take a little bit of your work because I'm, you know, I've got my sourdough starter. I'm suddenly a gardener and, you know, I'm, I'm living this COVID life, but I'll take some of your work to make everyone, you know, a little bit more even. Um, have, have you noticed the same thing? I'll open this to our panelists. Have you noticed your team's just kind of coming together and trying to help each other through this and make everyone feel supported, safe, included? I would say yes. I mean, for all the above reasons that you just stated. There's a lot of parents that, I, that are my peers or managers. Um, and really, we just have open, honest conversations of like, hey, between X and Z hours, I need to homeschool my kid. Um, so I'm going to be unavailable. And at that time, I have this meeting that, you know, with so-and-so stakeholders, could you just like step in and then we'll catch up later during our one-on-one -on -one or, or at a later time. And, you know, a lot of teammates that are childless like myself um, that are spending their their quarantine bartending and like making cocktails um, happy to pick up the slack and do that for each other because then down the line you know knowing that if I have to step away for whatever reason that my teammates have my back in those cases and so it's really give and take in that sort of way well um... I can't speak for the young folks on my time, but they're not helping me none, right? <laughs> and nobody's lending a hand for nothing, right? Um, but, you know, we do a lot of, what, you know, design thinking. So we have multiple work streams. So if I'm busy or I can't do something, nobody bothers me. And, and, and again, you know, um, I, I'm on a diversity team, right? So um, I have my pillar, you know, my lane. I'm, I'm the only diversity recruiters, four of us, right, that cover the entire U.S. Um, so nobody kind of bothers me too much, except, you know, now it's more of how can I help, right? What can I do? How can I be an ally, you know? Um, so I try and find a lot of work for them in that aspect. I've noticed on my team, people are much more flexible about time. Um, we, we always kind of had to be because we're a global team. Uh, we have people in Europe all the way to uh, the West Coast, so that's always a, a bit of a challenge. But there are people with young children that have switched their schedules. So they will, say, not work during the early part of the day, because that's when their partner is going to be working, and they will take care of the children during that time, and they will kind of work um, in the afternoon to the evening, um, and then their partner will take over for them. Um, so we've seen a lot of kind of accommodations for people changing up their schedule or saying like these blocks of time are, you know, I'm, I'm homeschooling or these blocks of time I'm spending with my family. And, and there's certainly not been any pushback. There's been just how do we accommodate that? Um, which I think honestly is an indication of an inclusive team in or outside of a pandemic. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think all of us would, if given the choice, we'd prefer to work with people who support us and, you know, want to make sure everyone's happy and, and thriving. Um, but I, it's so fun. I, um, back in my previous life, when I got that useless psych degree, um, I did a lot of study on basically, you know, how people react to other people in need. And I've been both pleasantly surprised and disgusted 
based on various behaviors on, on various people's parts through this. But mercifully, I think more people than not are trying to come together and support their teammates, their family members, their fellow man through this. Um, because, you know, we don't know how long it's going to be this way. Um, I'm going to need this to resolve before the next Dev Nexus, though, because I really enjoy going to that conference and uh, the speakers dinners are always superb. And so I'm really going to need this, this pandemic to get it together so I can go back to conferences. It's a thing that needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, my sky miles, uh, I'm not, you know, moving up, you know, I paid for a uh, clear, like for the last four, when they first came out, I got clear. And I mean, I just thought I was the man, you know, so I'm I'm not getting to take advantage of that, you know, oh, the travel and, you know, I love my wife. I love my children. You know, I love them so much. I really do. But I, I got to, you know, I got to get some fresh air. I got to hit a plane and fight with somebody sitting next to me or something. Um, yeah, I, I think that. And, and, you know, my household is a little different because we went into the um, the child idea because we both were career oriented, you know, graduates, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the family thing came about. And I just, I kind of, you know, I didn't want to be on the rat race of, you know, getting your kids to work, to school, then we both go to work, mm -hmm. then we get off work, we get to school, you know, the sort of the rat race thing. Um, and so we had decided that, you know, she would, she would be a stay at home mom, we would, manage the children to a certain age um but now i'm ready for them all to get out or at least me to get out or we all just get out for a second so actually valerie, valerie you bring up a good point uh and i think this fits into this uh conversation on diversity and inclusion which is uh during this pandemic you, you know you said that you you have teammates pulling you know teammates who can uh picking up the the slack or whatever right um uh it have it, it, does anybody have any thoughts on like kind of mental health uh like around work and well just i guess life in general and um because obviously uh being uh stuck at home either with your family or by yourself uh is probably not good for your mental health i'm guessing so uh just you know any thoughts on that like and i, I heard chris saying that uh, he's taken up, uh, you know, fishing in his little aquarium behind him, um, as well as playing the guitar. <laughs> but yeah, just any thoughts on like kind of how folks are dealing with that on their teams or just kind of in general? Yeah. Or how I, that fits into this in, in, inclusion kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I will throw this out. I was, um, so we do uh, safe, agile framework. And so I was made scrum master for a 10 week interval. And I started out every morning stand up with the typical, okay, you know, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm doing today. But at the end, we had a mental health check in, you know, and I, I went out of my way through that 10 week interval to make sure people were um, taking care of themselves in basic ways. So, you know, how uh, with GitHub, you can create a, a GitHub folder in your repositories and you can put in a code owner file so that certain people are always flagged for review of a PR and you can set up a template. And um, I actually stopped one step shy of adding to the PR uh, template. Have you showered in the last 24 hours? Have you had a hot meal in the last 24 hours? Does your code meet our style guidelines? And when did you last drink water? Like, you know, um, trying to check in on, on the people on my team and make sure that everyone is actually taking care of themselves was uh, definitely a priority of mine. I don't know, what is everyone else doing trying to, to take care of your own mental health and or your teammates? That's the, um, that reminds me of the three, two, one rule, which I heard about through DEF CON. I've never been to DEF CON, but just on Twitter, um, a level of neurodivergence within the InfoSec community um, and DevCon is huge and can be really exciting. Um, the three, two, one rule is every 24 hours, you need at least three hours of sleep, two meals, and one shower. If you're not doing that, go to your room. I don't think that's enough. Um, I often shower more than once a day, especially if I've been out in the yard. Um, I try to get six to eight hours of sleep a night. Two meals a day, I think is reasonable. 
Um, you know, healthy stuff, eating veggies, not just carbs all the time. Um, stretching a lot. Uh, I do a lot of yoga. Been walking around the neighborhood more. So I, it, I think getting out in the sunlight is is a problem for a lot of folks too. Um, they don't realize how that can affect them. So it's 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 about that mix and just staying in in touch with folks, uh, which is. I, I'm, I'm glad this is here tonight. I think it's good to see some familiar faces. And just what you said, Valerie, just check it in with folks and saying, hey, I really care about y'all. I hope everybody's doing well. So uh, uh, Erica and uh, Brian, our panelists, I, I believe are uh, people managers uh, at their companies. So uh, what, what are what are the two of you doing like to kind of, you know, uh, take into account mental health for your teams uh, during this time? Yeah, um, so I mentioned earlier checking in with a few of my teammates uh, who are uh, single and living pretty much by themselves um, and making sure that, that they're doing okay. Um, there was, uh, during a lot of the, the political unrest, um, one of my engineers is, is a black man and he was really struggling with some of it. And he was struggling uh, with his productivity because he wanted to keep doing and producing in the same way he had been. Um, and he was, he was telling me in his one-on-one -on -one that he was really frustrated that he couldn't get something done by the end of the week that he wanted to. And, you know, I had to kind of like put that aside and let him know these are very different times and to hold yourself to the same um, standards and the same kind of level of productivity that you held yourself when we weren't protesting every day and when we weren't in the middle of a pandemic um, and when there wasn't all everything going on at the same time is unreasonable. And I don't want, um, I would rather you be really excited about the work that you're doing. Um, so just really kind of candidly had that conversation with him. And, and if you needed a day because you couldn't get motivated or you couldn't get excited about the work that day, that was absolutely okay. Um, and I think that that kind of gave him permission to talk about some of the stuff that he was going through that was kind of blocking some of his productivity. Yeah, I second that as well. Um, with, with everything still going on, definitely opening the door to have those conversations with my teammates. Um, so actually putting time on the calendar to openly speak about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, civil unrest that's happening and all of the above, um, and really put it on the table like, hey, here's how I feel. Um, how are you all feeling with everything going on? Like, do you need that mental health break? Um, and for myself, really leading by example, with actually instead of saying like, hey, I'm going to be out of office this Friday, being frank with my team and be like, you know, I'm, I'm mentally drained right now. Like there's just a lot on my mind going on outside of work. I need a mental health day. Um, and I encourage you all to do the same when you need it, um, because I know you have families or, you know, like you said, you're living on your own. Um, and then, you know, giving the space for people to, to have the opportunity to be able to like say, yes, like I do too, also need that mental health day. So let me go ahead and take it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's great leadership. And I, I wish all leaders were so in tune to <laughs> that. I mean, because again, like I, I don't believe for a minute that people, um, that altruism exists, nor do I think it's actually desirable. I think that uh, systems where everyone benefits is, is better than altruism. Uh, and as, as it turns out, if your employees aren't being taken care of, if they're not being healthy, both physically and emotionally and mentally, if they're not being cared for, they're not going to be as productive. Your product is going to suffer. It's, it, it all plays into together. And I think sometimes, um, I think we lose sight of the fact that yes, we need to care for other human beings because they're human beings and that's the right thing to do. But also, we all have jobs. We all create products. We all want our companies to succeed. We want to advance in our careers. And yeah, I mean, thank you so much, panelists. All of the advice and stories you've shared, I think have, um, have been really great as far as teaching us and sort of cluing us all into how to support people so that we all can advance, we all can create better products, and we all can just do better. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's about time to wrap up. So I was gonna ask, you know, those listening, if we have any, you know, last questions uh, for the actual panelists, great. If not, we could totally just chitty chat. 
it might just be chitty chat time. And I'm really angry, Pratik. I'm angry that I'm not in the building, physically having this conversation with a beer, hanging out with you. I, I feel you 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Um, I think I have one quick question, and then the rest, I'll just chip chat later. But, um, it, I've been a developer for about 20 years, and I've been in different kinds of organizations and made different terms of diversity, in terms of culture. Some have been toxic, some have been very uh, welcoming. Um, and what I found over time is that it's better for a person to move toward the less toxic companies as opposed to the toxic ones. But I think for a newcomer, um, especially a person who's um, a minority um, or the only one in the room, they may not know, they might think this is the norm. And um, do you have any tips for a new developer starting a company and things just don't seem right and they're wondering, is this normal or not? Because <laughs> um, just a quick example, like what I've seen sometimes is if you're the only one in the room, you kind of adopt the culture of the majority and you follow what they do and but when there's kind of like a critical mask of people like you in the company as well, um, you'll see more, a more relaxed and more of the culture of that person and, and that group come out and in the company and also benefit the company. Um, just that if one thing, if, if for no other reason that you're more relaxed, like I'm not the only person, they're gonna fire, you know, not gonna fire just me, right? So, but I just, my question is, um, have do you have any advice for someone that's coming into a company and like things to look out for i, I would say the first thing is find a network um of people that you can share with and um uh, whether it's just to vent whether it's just to um see how they would handle certain things i remember maybe a couple of years ago we were at uh, a women who code meetup at, at general assembly and there was a young woman who had just started her first tech job and she was trying to say really nicely that they are driving her crazy. Um, and she didn't know like what was happening. And so she would tell us about certain scenarios. She was like, is it me? And she was like, and we were like, no, no, that's not you. And so sometimes you just need someone to do a sanity check to say, no, that's a very weird environment. Um, and it's not you. Um, and these are some ways that we've dealt with different environments. So I would say the first thing is find a network. Um, then next I would see um, like, what does psychological safety look like at the company? Um, I think that's a good indicator whether the person might be from a marginalized background or not. Um, if anybody on that team feels comfortable bringing up ideas or suggestions, whether they're super junior or, or senior or no matter what their level of expertise is, they, do they feel comfortable bringing up things, possibly being wrong about things um, at that company? Because if people are scared to, to be wrong, that's an indication that you might be um, at a toxic, um, uh, in a toxic environment. So I would ask around, but I would also build that network. To add on to Erica, a lot of large companies like, you know, an IBM, we have what's called BRGs, business resource groups, and those are predefined networks already established. Um, and you have multiples in a city like Atlanta, we have women, Black, Latino, LGBT+, plus, whatever. There's also the developer arm, or you're in a developer, but you're in security. So there's all these pockets of network um, where you can kind of link in to make sure that's the right fit for you. Um, and you know, it also determines on that human being, right? You know, you have to be kind of confident and safe in your own skin regardless of who's around you and, and I think that that's important today as it was 20 years ago when I started you know I could have been run off and, and feared but I, I was confident in myself and my abilities and that's sort of a survival thing in the large intricacies and webs of um, corporate America you know, some roles in, in the developer role, you probably project oriented like a consultant. You know, if you're not on billable work, you're not delivering value. So it's really around the mechanics of that um, job, that company, and you know, your, your confidence in your skills. 
Um, I don't let anything too much. So I'm in HR. So, you know, 90% of my peers are all white women, right? Um, there's another, there are two males, um, and there's me, you know, the black guy in diversity, right? So, um, you, you know, you have to feel good in your own skin wherever you are. And, and if you're uncomfortable, then yeah, maybe that's not the right fit. Hey, uh, everyone, speaking of uh, diverse home situations, I just got an SOS text from my partner. Apparently two of our three children are at the ocean melting down. So I am gonna go save him because he has been delightful in keeping the three of them alive so that I could do this. Um, I would like to thank everyone who participated. This has been delightful. Uh, I wish it were in person, but this has been wonderful for what, what we're able to do across the miles. Yep. Hey, Valerie, thanks for moderating, and uh, we'll let you get going and uh, rescue uh, your children. <laughs> oh, no, the children will survive. It's Michael, I have to say. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> See everyone next time. Thanks, Valerie. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank thanks, you Val. so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, this, 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 this Zoom call is going to be open for a while, so, I mean, you know, we'll just chit-chat. Or yeah, someone or asked if I was wearing a TARDIS t-shirt. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all, I'm going to bail. I got a whole bunch of other things. You, you forget, even though you know, I've been working from home, I start my day at 8 o'clock. I'm kind of old school. I still start at 8, right? Unless, you know, it's been a long night. So, you know, I'm way past my nap time, for real. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so, um, hey you Anthony, you say something? Yeah, do you know Tommy Phillips? I don't know. You know, a, a lot of folks ask that, right? You know, there are over 375,000 people at IBM. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, you know, <laughs> what does he do? Right? I'll narrow it down. He was, he was a sales guy in the Atlanta area for many, many years. He, he has retired now. But because seeing as he was an enterprise sales place. guy, I, I thought you might have bumped into him. Yeah. So, you know, what I did is I started out on the product side and I mastered the product and then I understand the portfolio where the product was sitting. And so then I moved on to the client exec role. I was just kicking a double S and taking names. And then I got burnt out. You know, sales is, a, is, a, is an environment. Where you oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, something more impactful but hey you guys keep me plugged in you know wherever i can help um don't don't over don't don't over beat me up with more panel requests but <laughs> i can help out where i can all right thank appreciate you sir you. appreciate your time man. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. all right thank you thank you yeah i could do it again out right. of the house i'm going stir crazy yeah, you could always do what Valerie did and go down to the beach. Yeah, I mean, so there. so I've got a eight year old and a five year old, and the only thing worse than them being in the house tearing it up would be being somewhere where it's not their environment with none of their things driving <laughs> us crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so as much as I would like to go to the mountains or the beach, because that's a really good idea, I mean, I, I think that, that would actually be the end of me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to convince my husband to uh, do the cabin in the mountains for a couple of weeks, but he's not feeling it. I don't know why. Sounds great. Really well, I, I got cabins. a message. Uh, I'm going to give mes a message to Chris on the gardening side. If you put peanuts in with your tomatoes, you get free nitrogen injection. So cross plant, my friend. Yeah, I've got I've got more tomatoes than I can deal with right now. It's, ah, put peanuts. No, put uh, put peanut uh, raise peanuts with them. I'll try that. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that, tomatoes are actually in a raised bed. It's just traditional. But I've got a 210 gallon aquaponic system outside. That's got oh my gosh, <laughs> good lord, <laughs> strawberries are coming along, and all my minnows reproduced. So that was sort of the insight of the week is all of a sudden I have a lot more fish than I realized. I went from maybe under a hundred fish. I might have 500 fish now. Oh my gosh. Oh. 
So. The exciting stuff. <laughs> All right. You win. <laughs> well, the, the ecologically responsible thing to do would be to go and put all those fish into a local body of water, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's tilapia in the tank behind me. Uh, they got to get a bit bigger. I, the minnows I can technically sell as bait, but I just, they're like my children. I, I don't know. You, you don't think you could get emotionally attached to a fish, but... I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Chris, if they don't physically destroy your house every single day, they are not like children. Trust me. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, is there is carpet in this, so as long as nothing overflows, we're good. <laughs> I was going to say the one other piece of advice is even if you may not be a manager, if if you are just a to check with your team, I, I set up at least once every other day um, a question I ask and it's like, how are you? And then be prepared to, um, you know, just ask that. And it's amazing what your team meets will come back with. You just grab them personally and ask. But if you do, be sure to set aside some time during the day to actually listen. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn a lot about your teammates, but also gives them a great chance to just talk. And it's amazing what will happen from that point of view. You know, as much as we're on Zoom calls in front of computers all day, um, last week, the week before, a friend of mine, uh, David Neal, he, he speaks a lot at conferences on various things. He works at Okta, a security company. Uh, he put out a tweet that said, hey, I'm feeling kind of lonely. Anybody want to have a Zoom call later on today? And I jumped on and I think about, uh, I don't know, 20 other people jumped on that know David. And it actually turned into a bit of a David Neal roast. You, you were there, weren't you, Pratik? I was there. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, but the point is, it, I, I came off from, my, you know, that feeling. I, it, was, it was a really nice lift to my day. Now, I would see David around at conferences like three or four times a year or whatever. Uh, we'd have some fun. Um, but it was, and it was nice to meet other people, you know, that just, I've never, I, you know, I only knew like maybe two other, two or three other people on the call. Um, but it was a really good, um, you know, we just chatted for like half an hour. Um, and I, it left me feeling really positive, you know, so I think, I mean, I'm sure you guys do this, <clears throat> but you know, outside the work thing, if you're a manager, employee, whatever, checking in, just, just checking with some friends, you know? Um, and you know what? Do it during the day. I mean, everyone's at work, everyone's at home for the most part. You know, everyone can spare like, you know, 20 minutes to do a quick group thing on Zoom or, or Teams or whatever it is people use. Yeah, I've, I've gotten, I won't say in trouble, toe the line, uh, but trying to create some space for that at work where it's not so common. I think that's one of the interesting things about a lot of the gigs I get pulled into is um, I'm typically hired in as a change agent and have a different perspective and skill set from the rest of the org very intentionally. And uh, with a lot of systemic change, the, an important point to remember is not to change too much too fast. And that was not an option this time. A lot of stuff changed very rapidly uh, when we when the uh, pandemic broke out. Uh, but uh, I, you know, creating opportunities, it's, it's something I have the privilege to do, to, to ask these questions and create some space for some conversation and it's it's worked out well at work but i i think it's part of that work-life balance i've always uh, been a strong advocate for community efforts like this for that very reason um your identity as a technologist or an individual shouldn't be tied to your job 100 percent um you got to get out of that echo chamber at some point um and engage and I think I'm finally warming up to some of the remote stuff. I didn't like the tele stuff uh, starting off. I'm, I'm with Valerie. I'd rather meet in person, get out and see people, but uh, got to work with what we've got available here right now. Hey, speaking of remote work, um, you know, I've, I've like some other people, you know, in our group have worked remote for a number of years, but I'd like to hear about from some people that this is their first kind of remote work, um, you know, going from a, a corporate environment to now you're working from home. Uh, and the reason I want to hear is because, you know, my impression is, you know, both that, that person and the company's kind of been thrown into this with no real processes on how to handle it. I'm just, 
curious as to if, if anyone on this call has got some experience as to how that's gone. The work I'm at has responded very well, I think. Um, they got things shifted around in short order. Uh, they're not planning on bringing as many people back to the office full time. Uh, they shifted a lot of folks to unlimited PTO just to allow some flexibility with time off. Uh, so from an organizational perspective, uh, I think it's been the, ex the exception to the standard now for a little while that um, it's kind of weird when I hear people in tech that they need to go into the office for eight hours every day. I, I, that doesn't seem to be the standard anymore, but maybe I'm not talking to the right folks. I mean, does anyone else have a perspective <coughs> on, uh, you know, all of a sudden this is like <coughs> the first time for remote work and, and how the company's handled it and, and how you've handled it? I mean, for my part, like the, the tools and systems part, that worked itself out within a few weeks, right? Like it was very sudden, very chaotic for a short period of time and now that's studied out and it's even what's much weirder for me is the idea of settling in for the long haul where it's probably going to be spring or summer of next year before i'm back in an office and my whole job was in person my whole job was interactive and now everything is through a screen so i'm kind of internally processing dealing with a complete change not just to my job but my lifestyle and my way of interacting with people um, and I think that will just take some time, but I'm very curious to hear what other people say. I agree with that too. I, I think one of the few things I do miss is those hallway conversations you just have, um, that like inspires some interesting thing that you should then look into later or being able to like whiteboard with somebody. I still haven't quite figured out how to do that effectively. I feel like everybody just kind of jumbled all over the place. Um, and also having a proper desk. Like right now I'm sitting at my dining room table and I have been since the beginning of the pandemic. So investing yeah. in a proper workspace is, is definitely another thing I do miss. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about anyone else, but like I loved my job before pandemic and now my job is just fine. I can do it, it works out. I do it, I finish it, the day, day is done but I don't love my work life anymore. And that's not to say I hate it. It's just not that intensely positive, great feeling. And I'm trying to figure out how to recultivate that in my everyday, because it's very important to me. I, I echo what was said before about just because you're, you're accustomed to working from home, it's not the same as working from home in the pandemic. Yep. Uh, I had a job before where I worked from home for about five years. Then I went into the office working in Atlanta and kind of suddenly going back to working from home, it's a whole different feel. Like back then, like you said, I had I had an office of space that was just closed doors. I had a real desk. I had like all my monitors and things like that. And I'm also now using my living room table as my uh, as my desk, <laughs> and it's not the proper height. So um, it's it's definitely a big difference. Um, plus, all of the the I'm an introverted person anyway, so I don't really need to be around people, but I do like to occasionally interact with people in real life. So when we kind of open the office. Um, a month ago, I would go in like one or two days a week just for a few hours just to actually just be there and kind of see some people and then leave. Like I don't I don't need to stay eight hours, but I just need to have contact with other human beings. Yeah, I found that, you know, in this, <clears throat> I mean, I have worked remote for a while, but working remote for me would be, you know, sometimes working at home if I needed both my screens because I'm doing some you know, whatever I'm doing in these two screens. <clears throat> but most of the time I would go to a co-working space or go to a coffee shop. I would leave the house. Yeah. So, um, Starbucks. Yeah, or, well, Starbucks is too noisy. It's coffee grinders. All day long. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is I could, I could leave and yeah, I still could leave now and the co-working space is open, but I'm like, ah, I don't know. 
um, just to get me out of, of this environment. And it actually helps me focus more. I, you know, I get bored at home, frankly. And it's not that I get distracted. I just get bored. And I, I kind of like, I don't, I'm glad I don't have to go check into the office, you know, like I used to. Um, but I like the kind of ambient noise and ambient motion that you get in a work type environment or that I used to find in a co-working space or a coffee shop, whatever, you know, you'd be doing your thing and there's people moving around and you, there's snippets of conversation going on, but you're in your own world. And I really miss that. Yeah, there's energy to feed off of. And now that's just not there. Yeah, even at the co-working space, I'd have my work, my work friends that I would see like, yeah. whenever I was there because they would be there too and we'd chat about something. Yeah, <laughs> it's motivating and it's just it's <clears throat> fun, frankly. I feel like I'm now permanently stuck on like the silent floor of the library where no one's allowed to talk and it just like it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm in my spare bedroom. Like, I mean, it's okay. I've got a desk and all that, but, uh, you know. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm actually in an asteroid field right now, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I haven't done the, um, the remote equipment splurge. It felt like an impulse earlier on in the pandemic, um, but I'm tempted to now get a ring light and a camera, like a nice camera and a, I don't know. And a raised desk, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's against my nature. I'm not, I'm not too gadgety. I'm a pretty... Uh, minimalistic individual i'm just i I keep things pretty basic but it it might be fun i tell you now's the time right the last thing i invested in was these these sennhauser headphones uh and they're gaming headphones and someone uh beth lang who runs women who code atlanta turned me on to this uh because i used to be on these calls with my you know airpod in and i hate having something in my ear for an extended period of time um or i just have the phone on you know on speaker uh, or the laptop, you know, uh, just use the laptop speakers. But this is really great um, because it's super light and it's, I've been wearing it for two, you know, hour and a half now. And it's not, you know, it doesn't get sweaty because it's really aerated and stuff. And it was a great investment. But you know what? It's taken me how long? When, when do we do this, start this kind of lockdown march? It's taken me since then to figure out that this is the right thing for me to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, do, to do this type of thing a lot, you know? Well, for me, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm kind of like Chris in a sense. Uh, I did the, I've done, I've been doing the gardening thing this year. I just ramped it up, but uh, folks, I'll, I'll, I mean, to me, this is the other thing I do now that's, you know, been a hundred and something degrees out in the day, it's less or so, but um, it's 90 minutes on 20 minutes off. It might extend your day, but what you do is you work heads down for 90 minutes, no more than two hours. And then you get up and you go walk or exercise or do something that's not hyper focused and sitting in front of a monitor, especially if you're coding or prepping materials. Um, you know, I code all day. I'm working on some training material. I'm going to be working on three talks and I can find myself sitting for six or seven hours or sorry, maybe not that long, but maybe three or four hours and then going, what happened? Why do I have to go to the bathroom? Didn't I just go and you look at four hours later? um set those timers get up get outside walk around stretch uh go check on the tomatoes um whatever it is you do give yourself those emotional brain breaks even if it's even if you may be sitting maybe that's a great time to just check with somebody say how are you doing and build that those emotional context um we have to inject that variety ourselves now where before it was kind of like i I was like vincent i'd go to the starbucks and anytime anybody called me between 8 a.m. and 11:30 a.m. or 12, I was at a Starbucks every day, five days a week, because I needed that variety. Now I have to do it in a different way. So give yourself those breaks. Yeah, I started buying five-pound bags of coffee from Whole Bean, from Rev Roasters in Smyrna, um, who I will endorse. And uh, I've been drinking that for weeks. And eventually got um, a little buggy and decided to go get a coffee from Starbucks and pulled through the drive-thru. And I think it ruined it for me. <laughs> it wasn't good anymore. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Um, trying to drink more tea now, too. Just keep things. To your point, yeah, it sounds like good Pomodoro practice. Uh, 
with the timers. I, I had a kitchen timer. Uh, yeah, got a little kitchen timer here I use for that. Yeah, I, I don't drink much coffee. The only time I would really get a coffee is when I would go to Starbucks to work or sometimes on my way to the co-working space. And like now that I don't do that, I'm like, oh, I actually haven't had a cup of coffee for, I can't even remember the last time I had a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's the one thing I don't miss. I do that every morning, make a cup of coffee. Yeah, same. It's like, uh, I actually am a heavy sleeper, so my alarm clock is in the kitchen, and it's next to the coffee maker, so I hit the alarm clock, turn the coffee maker on at the same time, and that's like a daily, <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't mess with that one. I must tell you what I used to do years ago, because my, my mother was Italian, so I grew up with those little um, stovetop coffee makers. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. It makes like one espresso or two espressos or whatever. It's called a cafeteria. Uh, and there's this, this whole process for it. You've got it's this three-piece aluminium thing. You've got to unscrew it, and then you and then you pat the pat the coffee, you know, grinds into the little sieve, sieve thing, and then you fill the top with water or the bottom with water rather. And you put it on the stove, and you wait for it to bubble, and and start start whistling. Uh, and then you so it's not just like it was a it was a uh, a, a little bit of a ritual. You know, it took some effort to get that really nice cup of coffee but for me that was just more of a oh <clears throat> I, I used to do this when I lived by myself because I didn't have anything else to do uh, and no distractions <laughs> but it was like a, this little ritual which I'm now remembering maybe I need to get one of those again yeah I have, I have friends that are kind of appalled that I'm drinking ground coffee now um, they're like really you're not having like Nescafe or anything like, I'm like yeah that's what I'm drinking now <laughs> it's enough i don't i don't need to because i have a french press but again the effort of like pushing the thing down and grinding the coffee beans i'm like no i just need straight caffeine you know you can buy the ground beans already vincent right you know it's it is 2020 after all <laughs> <laughs> no but i still got to do it in the water and plunge it. So i'll use i'll just boil the kettle so what you're saying is the ux of the of the of the coffee <laughs> press is just way too much yeah, too many steps. <laughs> too many clicks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd love to hear the flip side of this question, right? Like those who have been working remotely for a long time, what do you love about it that hasn't changed that maybe someone who's new to working remotely could learn to appreciate? Well, I, I like the um, I like the flexibility. Okay, yeah. because, you know, life happens. All right, so working remotely, it gives you a chance to, to go do life um, outside of not, not being able to do it for like an eight hour period, if you know what I mean, or, or however long it takes from you leave the home to go to the office and then by the time you get back again. And I don't know what those life things are. They could be anything. You know, it could be taking a package to the post office. I don't know. Or fixing something yeah. real small that's been just bugging you for weeks. It's, it's the flexibility to be at home <clears throat> for when life things like that happens that I, I, I really do love. And just to piggyback on that, like being able to work from anywhere too, right? Uh, you yeah. mentioned kind of going to the coffee shops and, and getting yeah. a different environment, but there are times where, you know, I had to help my dad somewhere and I can work from Augusta instead of, you know, having to go into the office. Sure. And so I don't have to take a day off to help my dad. I can actually do both. Um, that's sure. something I still love about working remotely. Yeah, and I would like, you know, one of the things that I would do uh, in the past was like, you know, we, our family, we wouldn't go on like a big vacation. We'd go on lots of short breaks, uh, you know, like a three-day weekend or something. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just take Friday or whatever or Monday if the kids are out of school uh, and we just go somewhere. And I, I could still work wherever I, you know, to Erica's point, wherever I am, I can still do whatever I need to do, um, you know, on the way there, on the way back or when I'm there. Uh, and, and, and luckily, you know, fortunately, the, the kind of job I, I was in and the kind of company I worked for and the kind of boss I had mainly, <clears throat> nobody cared what I was doing as long as I, I met my deliverables. Um, you know, when you, that's a great plus of being remote. Um, you, you, it's something that you, you obviously don't get when you, you need to go at a, to a building. Um, you know, if you're not there, you're not there. And maybe someone's going, well, where are they? But also that depends on, on your management too and how they feel about it, you know. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's really hard to micromanage a person remotely. 
So yep. that's a benefit for sure. One of the things I don't like, you know, I don't, it's not that I don't like about it that's challenging is that, and then we all face this these days. Well, we all face this because we work in the tech business and we're all so connected with our devices 24 seven. It's, it's harder to just switch it off, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and one of the, you know, it was easier when I was had a job where I went there and came home and then I didn't really do anything till the next day for the most part, uh, started working remotely. That's really not the case. Um, yeah. But that's that's more about me because I'm a workaholic. <laughs> yeah, I think it's easy to lose track of time. <clears throat> My boss actually last week is like, at five o'clock, I want you to actually log off your computer, turn it off. He's like, just walk away, <laughs> like you're done. You know, um, you know, don't. It's really easy to kind of like just slip off and just keep going, and then you know, I can do some coding while I watch TV and, you know, I can eat my dinner right here or, you know, like, no, no, just stop, stop, take a break, take a nap, go to sleep, do other things. But yeah, I, I really like the freedom of being able to follow a thought and then take a break when it makes sense to take a break and not be structured into the, we're going to be in meetings for these many hours. We're going to be at lunch at this hour. We, it's a more natural schedule. Yeah. It's a great meeting, everybody. I'm going to call it a night. Yeah. All right, Brian. See you. Thank you. Good talking to y'all. Thanks again, Brian. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great perspective. Uh. I think that there's a um, there's a call that I'm on every two weeks of some <clears throat> folks that 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 used to see each other at conferences a lot. It's at like I don't know four o'clock Eastern because it's like one o'clock California, which is where most of them are. And you know it's real cool and casual. People drop on and off uh, however long they want to be there. <laughs> I think the other day I was I was on it for about 40, 40 minutes and I had to go. And then I, I kept seeing screenshots on Twitter for the next four hours. <laughs> they just kept people just kept going <laughs> not everybody because you know there was less and less people in the screenshots but <laughs> they were having fun has anyone else um like the company you work for try to create activities like online activities to kind of keep the togetherness going like we had a thing um a couple of weeks ago we had a netflix party and we watched um I forgot what it's called, but it was like this kind of rom-com. And all the while, we were all commenting and making jokes. And that was really fun. I like those kind of ideas. Uh, we've done uh, Gametopia nights. And I've got to actually reorganize. I haven't organized one in about a couple, three weeks. But we get together about once every two weeks and pick a, um, whatever game was available. We all jump on and we all play like various card games, board games, whatever. It's really cool. Oh, that's cool. Gametopia? Yeah, I think it was. Let me look it up. It's actually been about three weeks since I did it. How about, LAN, how about LAN parties? Is anyone getting back into that now that we're back in the <laughs> <laughs> It'll be uh, internet LAN. Well, <laughs> LAN. What was it? Vincent, I'm looking up the name of it. Give me a sec. I'll, I'll find it. Gametopia. Oh, it's not Gametopia. It's something else. And I, I can't believe I forgot. Let's see. We've, y been, we've been using Roll20 for, for d and D. I I would never have guessed my D&D games would have continued. It's wonderful. Roll20? Yeah, it's fantastic. Nice hey, technology. Hey, Melanie, where'd you get that t-shirt? <laughs> Isn't that great? It matches my horse. It does. <laughs> it's good to see everyone's faces. Sorry I'm not videoing. I've I'm just burned out on Zoom today. Understand. So for those on the those on the call that don't aren't aware of what that t shirt is, we gave it away at, at DevNexus last year to speakers and basically whoever wanted one. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's the uh, Millennium Falcon. But it's got a serial. It's got a serial number on it, which is the uh, the serial number of the Starship Enterprise. You know, it's kind of real small in one of the quadrants, and uh, kind of it's one of those kind of things where if you get it, you get it, and it's like, you know, it's wrong. <laughs> the best 
part is my team is the enterprise engineering team and my counterpart <laughs> the next generation team. So next oh, gen no. oh. fantastic. Bert, I love your background. Thanks, yeah. So my uh, thought that's it. It's Tabletopia. Tabletopia. Yeah. Tabletopia. Uh, I'll look that up. So my next thought for the the Dev Nexus shirt, my one of the ideas I had was gonna be um <clears throat> Star Wars, The Wrath of Han. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, you know, I like doing it real subtle and see who notices. <laughs> no, no, it'd be Star Trek, The Wrath of Han. Yeah, sorry, Star, Star Trek, The Wrath yeah. of Han. Yeah, yeah, I like That's it. That's what I meant. That's good. Star That's Trek, good. The, Wrath the Wrath of, of Han. Han. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. It's fun. There are people who get really upset when I'm wearing those shirts, the, like the Star Wars Wrath of Khan, Wrath of, uh, yeah, Star Wars Wrath of Khan. Yeah. People are like, that's wrong. It's so wrong. It's oh, I know. That, that oh. shirt started so many nerd wars, man. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. Go the other direction, do Khan Solo. Khan Solo. Khan Solo. Oh, yeah. Khan Solo and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> Ooh, ow. Oh. <laughs> Shatner with a whip. There you go. <laughs> I was trying or I was trying to think of some battle, something I can mix with Battlestar Galactica, because I'm a huge Battlestar Galactica fan. <clears throat> but I haven't quite thought thought through that one yet. You could just go with the Schwartz. Call it a day. What? <laughs> Call it the Schwartz. Schwartz. The Schwartz. Yeah. Spaceballs. Spaceballs. So really, really Spaceballs funny. the movie. Spaceballs the lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny with the, this year's Dev Nexus one, that kind of Enterprise and um, Millennium Falcon mashup silhouette yeah. thing. Uh, <clears throat> I was like on um, on uh, Google, on Gchat with uh, Stephen Chen. Um, those that don't know him, Stephen works for JFrog. He runs developer developer advocacy there. And uh, I was kind of hacking these designs together in like Keynote. Uh, is, what was hilarious about this is that Stephen and I were online together doing, going over various options for four hours. <laughs> it wasn't like, I was like, hey, Stephen, how about this? And he's like, well, why don't you change it to that? And that just turned into like this four hour marathon of just iterating on this design. <laughs> wow. Okay. You make time for the things you love. Right? I, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, I think I'm going to head out. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thanks, Erica. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah, I think I'm going to bow out too, folks. Y'all right. have a great night, and we will talk to y'all later. Yep. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the same. I think we hit the tipping point. <laughs> we did. <laughs> All right, everyone. I'll All end right, the call. Good long and prosper. Wait, let me find the leave button. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Can you find the leave button before I find the end button? <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>